good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are and what is the time uh, where you are attending it. Welcome to the journal club organized by the physical review journals of the American Physical Society. Uh, before we start with the journal club and some talk, uh, I will have a few words to say about the journal club and how, uh, what is the best way to participate to it. So uh, I will now share screen and let you know about, about some details. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Yeah, so uh, the, the name of the, the title of today's talk is Achieving the Ultimate Quantum Timing Resolution. Uh, a talk will be about the paper that has been uh, published in uh, PRX Quantum, a new journal of uh, uh, American Physical Society, a new member of the Physical Review family. The talk will be delivered by Wahid Ansari and will be moderated by Yaron Brumberg uh, from Hebrew University of of, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, before I give a word to Yaron and uh, start with the talk, uh, let me say a few words about the Journal Club. So uh, as you know, we are uh, part in a Zoom session. So here is the way how to use the Zoom session the, in the best way uh, to participate in the Journal Club. Uh, as you can see, uh, we will see all of the participants that are listed uh, on the list. If you want to ask questions following the talk, there are two ways of doing it. One way is raise your hand in the participant list and then the moderator and the hosts of the talk will be able to see that and call on you. Uh, the other way will be to, to type your question in a chat box, in which case, again, the moderator will see the question and can call you. Once uh, you are called to participate, please unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you wish so, so that we have the one-to-one -one co uh, communication between the speakers and, uh, and the participants, the person asking the question. Um, <clears throat> This is uh, done so that we can facilitate uh, a much more relaxed, much more informal communication between all of the participants and the people that are uh, the authors on the, on the article. As you can see by our backgrounds, the authors and uh, the moderator and the hosts of this meeting, we all have this yellow APS Journal Club background. So this is how you, how you can see who we are and, and how to address us. Uh, of course, you can address your question to any of the participants in on the screen, uh, any of the authors on the screen. Uh, you can also turn your speaker view and to see everything uh, better. Uh, with that, I would like to say also a few words about the journal where the paper was published. Uh, my colleague Katyusha Kazemiro, who is here, and myself, we are co-managing editors of this new journal. The journal uh, has been designed to be a, a home for the quantum information science and technology communities. Uh, we are an open access journal and highly selective in the papers that we publish. Uh, we have a dedicated editorial board of leading experts with whom we uh, communicate all the time and we ask for their opinions and advices on, on uh, uh, technical questions and uh, certain papers. Uh, another novelty that we have is that apart from the publishing a groundbreaking research in the in terms of uh, regular research articles, we have a new uh, types of articles, perspectives and tutorials that are completely new uh, for the APS and physical review journals as such. Perspective articles uh, are supposed to be visionary work showcasing potential impact of future developments. We have so far published three perspective articles and the one displayed on the slide by Ivan Deutsch was an inaugural uh, perspective that takes on the whole field of quantum information science and technologies as it is. Uh, we also publish tutorials, uh, which are hand-on guides uh, for communicating essential knowledge uh, and references, uh, and it's aimed to senior PhD or junior postdocs in the field, enabling them to uh, read, absorb the knowledge from the tutorial and having a hands-on 
uh, skills and techniques to start research and start getting ideas in the new field of research that they are uh, embarking on. Uh, uh, this is our journal website. Please visit our website, see the papers that we are publishing, and we hope you are going to enjoy this. Uh, with that, I would like to turn to, uh, to Yaron and uh, uh, once again to, to, uh, to announce our speakers. Our speaker, uh, Wahid Ansari and Yaron Bromberg, who is a moderator of this session. Yaron, it's, uh, it's on you. Thank you, Stoyan. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today, so thank you for the invitation. And thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. I'm excited from the opportunity we have to uh, hear Dr. Vahid Vansari uh, present his work on achieving the ultimate quantum timing resolution. Vahid Ansari is a Bloch postdoctoral fellow at Gidston Lab in Stanford University. He received his PhD from Peter Bourne University in 2018, working on temporal modes in quantum optics under the supervision of Professor Christine Silberhorn, who is also with us today. So Vaid will be presenting for about uh, 20 minutes, and then, as Toyan said, uh, the session will be open for questions and discussions. Uh, you are welcome to write your questions in the chat box or simply raise your virtual hand at the end of the talk. So, Vahid, I think it's a good time for you to take over. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? And can you see the slide? Yeah, it's all good. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for the uh, introduction, and thank you, um, Stoyan and uh, Katyusha and APS for uh, organizing this and uh, the invitation. Um, and uh, thank you uh, to everyone to uh, for tuning in. Uh, I see a lot of um, familiar uh, names and the participants, which is very nice. Um, um, I think there's a lot of people from Europe, uh, which is in the afternoon and uh, from other parts of the world. Uh, I'm tuning in from California, which is still uh, in the morning, and I'm still slowly uh, waking up. I used to be a morning person, but uh, one of the side effects of the pandemic is that I'm not anymore. Um, so uh, <laughs> I think everything's going to be fine, hopefully. Okay, uh, so I want to talk about um, uh, uh, timing resolution um, at the quantum limit. Uh, so let me get started um, by um, telling you about um, few areas in science and technology that um, uh, timing resolution and resolving, for example, pulses are very uh, important, uh, especially in, specifically in incoherent imaging. Um, this, uh, like the, the, this is a very incomplete list. Uh, you have uh, applications like uh, positioning systems, LiDAR, um, um, sensors, for example, in gaming consoles, uh, optical co coherence tomography, uh, more fundamental areas like tests of general relati uh, relativity. Um, in uh, uh, these applications, there are number, there's a number of uh, methods and techniques that uh, are used to uh, do the timing uh, resolution, uh, resolving the uh, pulses, for example, uh, methods such as time of flight imaging, street cameras, and so on. <clears throat> this is just a um, a uh, quick slide to um, show that uh, uh, having better uh, res timing resolution in, in coherent imaging can benefit many areas uh, in um, uh, many areas. Um, so, but what is the uh, limit to um, uh, timing res uh, resolution? Uh, the main limit is um, uh, comes from uh, well, it's known as the Rayleigh's criterion, which uh, is a, a rough uh, rule of thumb that tells you if the uh, separation between the two pulses that you want to resolve is larger than the spread of each um, pulse, you can um, uh, resolve these two pulses. If the separation is uh, smaller than the distribution of each pulse, uh, tasks become uh, much harder at, uh, and at, uh, at some limit, it's become, it becomes impossible. Um, a more uh, severe limitation uh, comes from uh, photon shot noise, uh, which uh, means if you don't have a large number of photons uh, for measurement or you're limited in your uh, measurement time, uh, you're going to end up with a noisy data. In optics, this, this is usually uh, given by Poisson statistics and basically becomes uh, the, uh, makes the problem much harder, um, as you can see in this um, uh, in this cartoon. Uh, so um, 
in this talk, I'm focusing uh, basically um, on this case um, where uh, uh, you're dealing with incoherent, mutually incoherent pulses. Uh, can you see my cursor as well? I just, uh, yeah, good. Uh, so that we're dealing with incoherent, uh, mutually incoherent pulses at um, sub um, uh distance between them uh, where the photon shot noise is relevant and it's dominating the noise properties of the uh, problem. And also uh, we're dealing with passive imaging. That uh, is just mean that you cannot um, manipulate the emission uh, in a way that you can have selective emission and uh, resolve things better. Uh, just to mention, there is a um, large number of other methods that uh, would apply if you're not limited to this list uh, here. For example, if you're, you're dealing with coherent pulses or you're not limited by the photon, number, photon shot noise uh, or, and so on, uh, you can use a um, number of uh, very uh, elegant methods that are out there. But um, these won't apply for um, this uh, problem that I'm defining here. So it is useful to uh, formulate this uh, problem in terms of parameter estimation, where for the time being, I'm just gonna assume that we have uh, prior information about um, everything except uh, the separation between the two poles. And uh, the two poles are identical um, uh, and we are only interested in the, uh, to, to uh, measure and resolve the time resolution, uh, the separation between them. My apologies in advance, sometimes throughout this talk, I'm gonna, uh, say separation between the two poles. I'm sometimes going to say the time delay. This is just I use these uh, interchangeably. Um, so you can basically uh, use uh, methods, uh, very nice method, uh, uh, or um, concept known as Kramer lower bound to uh, basically calculate the errors um, of such estimation uh, here on the uh, x axis. Uh, I'm plotting um, the separation between the two poles normalized to the width of the pulses. On the vertical axis, uh, I'm plotting the uh, camera lower bound, which tells you what is the uh, minimum amount of error you can have um, for your measurement. And uh, the measurement uh, we're doing here is direct um, uh, imaging, uh, basically, which uh, simply measuring the um, pulses in time. Um, this bound is defined uh, with relation to um, uh, fissure information, uh, which is uh, simply a uh, um, quantity uh, defined like this that tells you uh, how much information you can get uh, uh, for your uh, uh, for quantity or measurement you're performing which uh, uh, with respect to a um, parameter of interest uh, s in this case uh, so i would be in this case your uh, direct imaging um, measurement and n here is the number of photons so at the limit of very very large number of photons uh, you can saturate this bound plotted here but as you can see this bound uh, is very uh, daunting at the uh, low side of it where the separation is very small and uh, it basically exponentially grows to infinity and makes uh, the measurement um, at some point impossible. Uh, so it turns out this limit is not um, fundamental in physics. Uh, in 2016, in the paper I'm citing down below, uh, Monkit Song and his group actually showed that if you use methods from quantum uh, um, um, information theory, and um, you can calculate quantum fissure information, um, uh, and you're going to get a new bound. As you can see, this bound uh, in this plot uh, surprisingly does not uh, depend on the separation between the two poles. Uh, it's a flat line here. What goes into this is simply uh, you allow um, uh, all measurements uh, um, uh, possible by quantum uh, um, mechanics uh, and you opt to find the optimal measurement uh, that quantum mechanics allow you to perform uh, not only direct imaging and you find this uh, surprisingly different limit here. So what is um, this optimal measurement? Uh, it turns out um, if you're dealing with the Gaussian quantum spread functions, uh, the optimal measurement basis would be Hermot Gauss mode. So if you instead of uh, doing the direct imaging perform your measurement in the basis of Hermat Gauss modes, you're gonna change the landscape of this um, error and you're gonna approach the uh, quantum bound. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this uh, in more detail. I just wanna say that actually we um, uh, showed that we performed this experiment uh, in 2018 uh, in this paper here uh, and we achieved um, uh, uh, so these this, uh, red uh, dots are the experimental data and we achieved something uh, um, um, basically beyond the uh, classical limit uh, or direct imaging limit and uh, we something very close to the 
uh, bound given by the quantum Fisher information. Um, so I just want to also briefly mention, uh, uh, give basically an intuitive uh, picture of why uh, this uh, would help you. So if you assume you have two pulses uh, that are incoherent, again, one is positively shifted, the other one is negatively shifted in time. And if you decompose these in terms of uh, their modes, um, uh, they're under the, uh, expand them simply. Um, and assuming the theta here is very small and you're gonna only need the, the first two uh, terms for the expansion, uh, as you can see, uh, the first term is basically common between the two, which uh, the zero order mode essentially is gonna contribute as a um, background noise. And, but the first order mode um, has, um, a uh, different sign here and uh, some information in it. Uh, so if you calculate the energy in the first order mode, uh, uh, like this, as you do for uh, two incoherent um, objects, uh, you end up uh, with some uh, non-zero value here, which is, uh, shows basically there's a significant amount of information uh, in this um, uh, basis. If you can perform uh, your measurement in this basis um, and you can channel the information in these modes into different channels and basically uh, do the measurement uh, in such basis. Uh, this picture also uh, shows you, uh, gives you a hint about where to look for optimal measurement um, basis. Uh, a nice, uh, good way of looking for these would be basically looking at the, the derivatives of the quinta spread function. Uh, I must also say I uh, stole this uh, um, uh, basically slide from Mankey uh, with his permission, of course. Um, so before I move on, I just want to also mention there uh, that there is a, also a large number of um, uh, uh, research actually going uh, uh, in similar direction, but uh, to resolve spatial modes better, um, which is very obviously uh, beneficial for making better telescopes or microscopes with a large number of applications, uh, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, but I just want to move on quickly now to actually the uh, results and the, um, uh, the results we have in this paper uh, that is subject of this uh, journal club. Uh, so I want to extend uh, the previous result to uh, multi-parameter estimation, where now we're interested in estimating uh, three parameters uh, between these two incoherent pulses, uh, unequal intensities, parameterized as Qs, uh, the, the separation between the two still, uh, at, uh, uh, which is tau, and the uh, uh, centroid of um, these, which is tau naught. Um, you can still, again, use uh, uh, similar methods. Um, uh, so you now uh, we have this um, uh, basically uh, mixed state um, defined as this row function, the row density matrix here, uh, uh, and this uh, vector uh, of uh, parameters we want to estimate. The problem becomes um, uh, very complicated uh, theoretically. I'm not going to go over theory, but you can calculate quantum Fisher inform uh, information matrix. Um, um, and we calculate the variance in a similar way as before. Um, this is a very non-trivial uh, calculation, um, um, as my theorist uh, collaborators tell me. Um, uh, but um, the main point here is that um, uh, you can, so depending on the uh, parameters that you want to estimate, it's not always possible um, to um, find measurements that collectively saturate the uh, bounds, uh, depending on the incompatibility of the measurements you're looking at. Um, but if you can find such measurements, uh, Basically, um, you will find um, the quantum bound uh, offering a significant improvement over direct imaging. And that's what we are gonna uh, look at here. So in this case, uh, the optimal measurements you need to perform are, um, uh, they look like this. Uh, so these are uh, modes um, uh, in time, for example, on the right side defined over the basis of the first four Hermat Gauss mode. Uh, so these are the coefficients for, for the first four, uh, four Hermat Gauss modes. If you uh, uh, basically uh, uh, plot this mode, uh, they look like this in time or frequency. Uh, so you need to perform some uh, measurement along these modes uh, to, um, uh, for an optimal measurement. How do we do such uh, um, non-trivial um, measurements? We, we're going to use something called a quantum pulse gate, uh, which is basically a device we're going to send um, or a mixture of pulses, a mixture of the input signal that we have to this device. Uh, we'll ask the device um, to operate on a specific mode, for example, in this case, in the Gauss mode, uh, and it would convert uh, the Gauss mode into a different port uh, and transmit the rest through. 
you can, uh, the device is uh, uh, programmable. We can ask it to now operate on a different mode. For example, first order her uh, Gauss mode. It would do the same with that mode converted to a different port and transmit uh, the rest through. Uh, you can um, uh, ask for superposition of modes and the arbitrary superposition of modes and we'll do uh, the same basically. Um, so you can think of this device as a programmable uh, beam splitter that operates on uh, temporal modes of light. Uh, the application this device has are um, uh, many uh, interesting applications uh, we found uh, for this device. Uh, th this is uh, a concept that was developed uh, in Paderborn uh, 10 years ago uh, uh, in the papers you see I'm citing down here. Um, and over the number of years, actually, we've um, uh, showed a uh, number of different applications uh, for uh, um, encoding information in the temporal modes of light uh, that you can find in the uh, papers uh, listed here. Um, so it's a process that, uh, uh, based on nonlinear um, process uh, uh, of some frequency generation, uh, let's look at that a bit in more detail. Um, so we are using here a nonlinear waveguide that periodically called lithium nibate waveguide specifically, and we're sending the pump field and the input field uh, together uh, to this uh, waveguide. Uh, the the, the, the waveguide um, uh, has some dispersion engineering and uh, the two field at two different color here would uh, propagate with the same group velocity through the uh, device. The mode that overlaps between the two fields uh, would get converted to a different color uh, here by green, uh, showed by green, uh, the up up converted signal or some frequency generation signal. And because of that, you can write down the intensity you have in the green or up converted signal uh, as uh, basically an overlap uh, integral between the two um, input fields, uh, between the input and the pump field. Um, as I said, we can also think of this as a, a beam splitter operation for temporal modes of light that the uh, uh, mode that you're operating on is defined by the uh, mode of the pump, by the temporal mode of the pump. Um, here's the um, image of the device uh, from the lab in Paderborn, um, which is a lithium nibate waveguide um, with a polling period of uh, four and a half micrometer. Um, there's some more detail here. And more importantly, most importantly, is this uh, group velocity um, condition, uh, which basically ma is matched between the two input fields and highly mismatched with the output field. And this uh, is essential to um, the operation of this device. Um, we are using, uh, uh, we are operating the device at the input frequency, input wavelengths uh, uh, of 1550 nanometer, and the pump um, uh, is at its uh, 860 nanometer. Uh, this is a, um, a simplified uh, cartoon of the experiment. Uh, we are starting with a tie stuff laser. Uh, uh, we're pumping uh, uh, an OPU up here, uh, and the OPU generates um, 1540 nanometer. Um, uh, pulses. Um, these are uh, femtosecond pulses. We uh, attenuate this strongly to a single photon level and use a um, pulse shaper um, to basically prepare our uh, input state. Um, um, the positively shifted in time and negatively shifted uh, in time pulses uh, the, and uh, to make them incoherent, basically the incoherent mixing is done by averaging over different uh, signal setting at the end uh, of this um, experiment. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, pump, pulse, uh, pump pulses are shaped through another uh, pulse shaper. Um, the two uh, beams are combined on a uh, diacritic mirror uh, that's sent through a um, waveguide and after that, you're filtering out all the pulses, all the, the different uh, fields, and only uh, looking at the um, up-converted uh, light at green frequencies um, on a single photon counting uh, APD. Uh, on the right, you can see a picture of um, a pulse shaper we're using for to shape the uh, pump pulses, uh, which is um, based on the diffraction grating and a spatial light modulator. So here's the uh, main result of our um, uh, um, paper uh, here. Uh, I'm plotting, uh, here we're looking again at this problem of uh, estimating these three, three parameters. I am, um, uh, we are taking pulses with a, a bit of one and a half picosecond uh, here. Um, here I'm plotting the three um, uh, parameters that we are interested to estimate simultaneously. 
to these measurements. Um, uh, and you can see on the horizontal axis, uh, the separation between the two pulses normalized over the bit again. Uh, and um, the orange line is the true program values. Uh, the shaded region is the direct imaging uh, lower, lower bound. And um, uh, you can see our experiment here, uh, and um, which is, follows very nicely the, um, the program uh, true values. And the, the, what you can see from here is basically we are essentially at the quantum limit of um, um, uh, expected quantum limit, uh, and depending on where you operate on this uh, landscape, uh, if you, for example, go on the left side of this, uh, where, where you have very, very uh, small separations, you can gain more than uh, more than ten times uh, uh, resolution to direct imaging. Uh, this is these are also um, uh, plotted for um, a specific value of Q. You can do the same for different um, values of Q as the as you change the relative intensity between the two pulses. Um, and uh, again, depending on where, uh, what the set of parameter, what, what uh, configuration you have, if you're uh, uh, on the right, very right side here that you have very large separation, as you can see, there's not much uh, improvement you can get for uh, such uh, uh, complicated or optimal measurements. But if you're uh, uh, operating at the um, um, uh, left side of these plots, uh, the amount of uh, the enhancement you can get is uh, very, very significant. I should also mention that these plots, both the experiment and the theory for, uh, for direct imaging uh, um, limit or quantum limit, they're all plotted for the same number of photons detected at the uh, detection. Uh, so uh, to have a fair comparison between um, all different schemes of measurements. Okay, uh, with this, I'm basically coming out uh, to the end of my talk. I think I'm also at my time limit. So uh, this is basically uh, just a, one quick snapshot of what I talked about. Uh, I'm not gonna repeat that again. And at the end, I just wanna uh, thank um, everyone uh, involved in the project, which is a wonderful uh, collaboration between the theorists and experiments at different um, uh, universities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vahid. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, so the, the session now is open for questions and discussions. And we would like to promote uh, a casual, informal discussion. Uh, so please, uh, when you ask a question, if you can unmute the microphone and, and maybe open the camera and say uh, one or few sentences on yourself and so we can uh, promote the discussion. Uh, so again, you can write your question at the chat box or, 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 uh, or raise a virtual hand and, and uh, we'll, we'll give you the opportunity to ask the question. Uh, so maybe we should give people a few minutes to, a couple of minutes to, to think of questions and, and, and ideas. And perhaps I'll, I'll start with uh, Vahid with a technical question. Uh, so you mentioned, you mentioned the dispersion engineering in the waveguide. Uh, can you comment a little bit more about the phase matching and the input bandwidth? Uh, is, does that somehow limit your resolution? Uh... Yes. Um, um, so I think the main like uh, resolution actually uh, of the device is um, defined by the uh, groove velocities uh, at the moment. Um, so that's the main uh, knob we have to uh, control uh, Interaction and uh, uh, this is specific. This is a uh, uh, so if you uh, like, I, I have to um, basically um, uh, refer to the papers we have on the on the um, uh, how the device operates uh, down here. But um, the resolution of the device is defined essentially as uh, how mismatched the input and output fields uh, are in, the, in terms of their group velocities. And phase matching is, um, um, by itself, is not really a limit here. Um, this is a very unusual group velocity uh, relationship. Um, and uh, all I can say briefly is that uh, this mismatch uh, defines the, how good this uh, device operates at this specific um, configuration. Um, I don't know if others want to also just uh, Give better answer. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you, Vahid. Uh, so I see Andreas has a Andreas Wagner has a question. So please, Andreas, if you can uh, unmute yourself and you know, and maybe say uh, present yourself and, and ask a question. 
Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. Uh, well, I'm, I'm part of the University of Vienna in Germany, and I'm a PhD student, and I just have a very quick question. Uh, you talk about um, how, how, how to separate uh, between incoherent pulses. What happens when they are coherent? Right. Um, it's a matter of debate. Uh, maybe I'll let uh, Luis actually answer that question because it's... Um, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, there is a heated debate those uh, days about what's going on when you have uh, partial coherence, okay? In fact, a couple of papers have been posted on the archive just in the last two weeks, okay? And the main idea is that uh, uh, this, uh, when we calculate, you calculate the quantum fissure information that Bahit has been calculating, this is, uh, this is the Fisher information per single detection. Mm -hmm. So you always have an N factor, which means the number of resources you have at hand. Mm -hmm. So the number of photons. But when you have a coherent superposition, okay, then it turns out that you have, a, you need to also to have the strength, uh, to take care of the strength of the signal. So mm -hmm. there are, points in the, in the superposition in which you have zero intensity and maximum, maximal fissure information. Mm -hmm. And then you need to, to when you have this, the incoherent superposition, <clears throat> the intensity is constant. You have a, a background. You don't need to take care of that. When you have a coherent superposition, you need to take into account the normalization and to see how much resources you have. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the final, the final answer is that, in principle, uh, in both cases, mode projections allows one to get the ultimate time limit, but the incoherent, the, the, the incoherent limit that Bahid has been discussed, discussed, discussing thus far, is an upper limit even also for coherent superposition. Okay. Mm -hmm. So coherent superposition is not doing better. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Luis and Andreas. Uh, and uh, while people are thinking on questions, uh, we are open to ask questions also on higher level. Uh, sorry, yes, I, I yeah, sorry, as a, as a host, I, I don't have how to raise my hand and expect me to just jump in and say my question. Sorry, I have to be impolite here. It, maybe just a follow up because I had a very similar question to the one of Andres. In, uh, and I was expecting that, that if you would have a coherence, this would improve. But then the question is in the experiment, I was thinking in a practical scenario. But you know when this starts? I'm sorry? Uh, does anybody know what time this starts? Okay, I think there is someone in the background. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so the question was if uh, you, you are in a, a more general scenario in the experiment that you could have a uh, um, superposition, uh, you, you could have both things happening, some scattering and you have incoherent superposition, but also perhaps some coherence. So I was thinking if you, if you are unaware of of what is happening, you just do the, your experiment and try to estimate. Do you know if you'd get errors or if you'd kind of always be on the safe side somehow? Do, do you know that? I, I'm sorry, I, I'm not seeing anything on the screen. That's why I didn't, I wasn't aware that it had. But, um, okay. Um, so from experimental point of view, um, uh, Katisha, to answer your question, uh, it's not going to add uh, extra error to the experiment because the experiment, um, the, 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 the way we're performing the measurements uh, would work for coherent or incoherent um, um, input states. But in terms of the quantum fissure information, as Luis was discussing, it changes um, what is uh, the bound uh, for direct imaging what is, and what's the bound for quantum fissure information. And uh, that yeah, maybe Luis can comment on that more, but uh, from the experimental point of view, it's not going to be a source of additional error, uh, systematic error. Well, I cannot comment on any 
in, in experimental part, but I, I mean, what you suggest is uh, in a way, imagine that I'm just recording, okay, made, making this mode decomposition, but I, I don't have anything, any knowledge about the signal. Yeah. And then one potential question is, uh, I mean, can you estimate not only the time separation, but also the degree of coherence is what you are asking, yes. okay? Yes. And the answer, the, the question is quite interesting. So it, it would be just a multi-parameter scenario in, in, in which uh, you want to estimate simultaneously, not only the time separation, but also the degree of coherence. And uh, we are working on that. Maybe from the experimental point of view, um, just to mention that the pulse gate itself, so the experimental apparatus works quite nicely. So the limits there, we see if you just look at the data itself, they fit perfect, well, almost perfectly fine with the scenario. So from the experimental point of view, I think there is not a real issue. If you see that, and this was, was also surprised us. I think we're doing that in the temporal domain. The pulse gate has, has its limitations, but, but for this kind of measurements, the experiments perform really nicely. I don't know if that answers your question, yeah. but uh, experimentally, we don't see a, a real issue here. Uh, please feel free also just to uh, open the microphone and, 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 and drop in and, and ask a question. And also questions can be, uh, we're trying to put those questions on a higher level, not specifically on the, on the technical issues of the experiment. So any any question that you feel is relevant. Uh, um, maybe maybe I, I have a chance to ask one more question. Uh, so and I think in one of the slides and the introductory slides, uh, you gave a very nice interpretation of, of that the time delay mainly affects the high order mode or doesn't affect at all the fundamental mode. Uh, and, and that somehow reminded me of uh, weak measurements where people subtract to, there's a small shift of a Gaussian and by subtracting uh, two Gaussian after the shift, you can see the, the derivative, which looks a little bit like the high order mode. I was wondering if it's, there is any, any relation to weak measurements or is it uh, in a completely different regime? I mean, may I just comment on that? I mean, I mean, I don't think from a fundamental point of view this has anything to do with weak measurements. But in a way, what uh, Vahid was presenting in this intuitive explanation is that, of course, you can expand the signal in any proper mode basis, and when this, the the separation, the time, the time offset is, is small enough only the first derivative plays a role. In principle, the complete measurement should in involve an infinite number of mode projections. So what we are doing here is just replacing this infinite number of measurements by only one. And from that point of view, I mean, yeah, you are making a weak measurement because you are discarding all the higher orders mm -hmm. and, and consider only the first. And the first is enough to give the most of the information. Of course, for higher separations, you need more and more, you need more and more uh, uh, mode projections, but in that limit, as Bahit saw in one of the, of the pictures, intensity detection, the normal detection with a CCD camera is enough, is, is, is optimal. So we are precisely in this uh, quantum, purely quantum regime in which this weak measurement is, is more than enough. Um, okay, I see we have a, a few questions. Uh, Oad, can you unmute yourself? And... Yes. So, hi, my name is Oad. I'm a student at the Yaron group. So, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, you briefly discussed uh, the case of uh, spatial separation between uh, pulses and the metals that you have there. So. Is there an existing method that is in somehow a parallel to what you did here in the temporal domain? Or do you think this can open new opportunities also 
in the spatial domain. So if you can comment on that. Well, I think there are uh, experiments actually uh, working uh, to show at least single parameter estimation in spatial domain using um, uh, some mode projections that are performing using typically using um, uh, some sort of uh, 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 special mode, uh, like uh, special mode shapers, like a special light modulator or face plates. Um, so there are very nice experimental techniques there um, uh, that are people working on. Uh, even the, uh, in the people in this uh, room, actually, there I know some people uh, has done some work along those lines. Um, so this, this, uh, the method we have here is um, uh, because you're using these wave guides. These wave guides are uh, especially single mode and. Um, so there's no uh, special degree of freedom, but um, the the yeah there are also like resemblance in between the techniques in in, in a sense. But um, yeah, I don't know if that answers. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Stoyan, I see your question. Yes, I have. I have actually a couple of questions. Uh, first one that is a rather general one, and then I also have one very technical question uh, for the theory part of of this uh, of this presentation. So let me start with the general one. Um, given that you now have a, a resolution that is pretty much at the limit of what one can expect uh, in the bigger picture, where can you foresee? the application of, of this technique and where can the, such a precise resolution yield more information in a practical sense? Who wants to chime in? I mean, I can comment on that if you want to aid. Please. Um, so one, one potential field of application of that technique is optical ranging, where you can improve the precision of the optical ranging. You can, for instance, take surface inspection, where you really want to measure very small differences. Uh, you have a reference pulse, the surface might be an incoherent scatterer. This is one field of application where you could actually use these techniques to improve existing systems. Um, as Lewis has pointed out, uh, these techniques are geared exactly towards the regime where established techniques like intensity detection are failing. So you don't have to reinvent a complete system, but you could imagine this just piggybacking onto uh, existing systems as an add-on for uh, operation regimes that you can't access with the original system. Okay, thank May you. I just uh, add a, a, a bit comment? I mean, from, from my point of view, what really is in, 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 uh, important from, from what Bahid was presenting is that mode projections in any field are almost close to the quantum limit. So the, the, the main lesson is that forget about, if you want to go to the ultimate quantum limits, forget about direct detection and make mode projection. And this can apply to time domain, to special domain, to any domain. And these mode projections are becoming more and more important even for companies that are now selling this product. Thank you, this, is, this all sounds very interesting. Uh, now, for, for my technical questions, uh, the previous slide that uh, Wahid has shown, uh, there is this uh, uh, form of a particular form of a beam splitter type of interaction uh, that, that your system can be reduced to in the form of C dagger D, uh, CD dagger operators and the Hermitian conjugate. So my formal question is, is there a strictly formal way in which the interaction and the procedure that you have outli outlined of this uh, picture can be reduced to this particular Hamiltonian form? And if it is, uh, what are the rough forms of the operator C and D here in composite operators, effective operators, I presume? Uh, 
so if I understood your question, uh, so you're asking what, like, um, how the operators look like, the operator C and D? Yes. OK. Um, so in this is, uh, implementation of the device we have at the moment, um, the output, uh, the creation uh, operator D, which is basically is um, uh, the photons of the up converted photon, uh, they are um, always something like a Gauss mode mm -hmm. yeah, to a Gauss mode. And the operator C in this picture is simply set um, by the user uh, or by the, whoever is controlling the experiment um, to any temporal mode you like. Uh, for example, it can be Gauss, Hermat Gauss, or any superposition. It's defined by the pump, basically. Um, uh, maybe, maybe, Wahid, uh, on a general level, there's a, the framework of temporal modes, and we have explanations for that. And it's basically the way you have to write that down is the coherent superposition of different frequency modes as we are used in classical optics for forming wave packets. And then you have an envelope function. And this envelope function gives you which the coefficient, so to speak. And then you can write that completely formally. And these are real bosonic operators with all the commutation relations. And we're very much used to these things in the spatial domain, Gaussian beams. You do the same thing in the time frequency domain. And then, but I just explained, this is what we call temporal modes. There we have an old, well, 2015 article where we describe this formalism very much in detail. Okay, thank you. Perhaps, I, I, Christine, I have a, maybe a, looking at this slide, a more higher level uh, question. So we see here that it's now almost a decade of work on, the, on quantum pulse gates of probably two or three generations of students. Uh, back 10 years ago, uh, did you envision that these uh, Nonlinear interaction in WaveGuide will develop it this way. Was there some kind of roadmap? Eventually, I want to get to to multi-parameter quantum limited estimation, or was it more like uh, discovering new and new, more and more features along the way? Maybe I can be a little bit can I talk a little bit about anecdotes here. Um, when we figured that out, so this is this formalism that we developed this pulse gates has even a longer tradition. So it comes from the idea of source engineering parametric down conversion, which nowadays is also a very established method. And we kind of transferred this mode picture, this temporal mode picture to some frequency generation things. I did that actually with students, or we did that, I should say, well, as you said, more than 10 years ago, uh, but you would see that most of the people <laughs> who are in this paper actually were participating there. So Benjamin Brecht was a PhD student, John Donner joined as a postdoc. Um, I was, was believing that this is really opening a new area and it takes some time. And there were some colleagues from I said, you're crazy. Well, you will never, this is a nice formalism. You will never be able to implement that because there's also quite a heavy technology that it works so smoothly. I didn't foresee at all that it will be metrology, which will be the application. But we're very excited because what we're doing is we're bringing concept from pulsed or ultra fast pulsed light, as I explained, together with quantum optics. And yes, we did think that this is a new thing. Um, actually, I should be honest, when we started that, not many people did see it the same way because it did ask why or what are you doing? Isn't that complicated? We didn't believe in that that's complicated. It was good fun. <laughs> <laughs> And now I think, now, now we see the fruits, but it took some time, I have to admit, <laughs> longer than we hoped. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, Andreas, do you have a, I see your ray, hand is raised. Do you have another question? Sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, it was more like a technical question. I saw in one of the slides that for imaging, uh, they use the Hermit Gaussian modes. And my question was, are these the only type of modes? I mean, does the theory says that these are the modes that you have to use or could be something else? Maybe the answer is, is, very, is very easy. So what we proved a couple of years ago is that the the optimal modes are always related to the derivative of your point spread function. Mm -hmm. So when you have a normal optical system, I mean, usually the, the, the fraction limit 
is just dictated by the diffraction of your, the, the points per function that for a single point is just a 80 function. But theorists, we don't like this J1 function. So we take only the first disk and this is, we approximate that for a Gaussian. Mm -hmm. But imagine you, instead of having a circular aperture, you have something like a slit. Then you have a sync function and then mm -hmm. the modes you have to project are just derivatives of the same function. And these are Laguerre modes. Mm -hmm. okay. So, I mean, the modes are just the derivatives of the points per function, orthonormalized, of course. Okay, I see. Thank you for your nice explanation. I can just add on that, uh, just from like the kind of experimental technical side uh, in terms of like what the, what's this device can do. There, we can project with it basically on any mode as long as it kind of fits in the bandwidth of our pulse shaper and plays nicely with the phase matching bandwidth of the device. So the modes that were that he mostly talked about were Hermite Gauss or you know superpositions of the first four Hermite Gauss modes. But in principle, by just changing the programming of the pulse shaper, you can project on time bins, frequency bins, uh, other strange shapes depending on the exact point spread function you have. Uh, so this kind of mode projection framework is versatile for potential other situations. Um, now that you mentioned that it, it comes to my mind, here you're using second harmonic generation, right? But if we go back to the, well, I'm talking about imaging right now. And if you use a, a spontaneous parametric down conversion, can you, uh, well, from this, you have your pump and you, you generate your signal and your idler. And would it be a way to shape the pump with different modes? And that may help to do different measurements for this improved uh, resolution. I'm just throwing an, an idea out there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's something we've looked into before mm -hmm. using the pulse shaping for the for PDC for tailoring the, the modes in a PDC state. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, let's just say we're looking into that indeed. <laughs> okay. In principle, if you want like custom shaped PDC outputs, some uh, just the general idea of dispersion engineering can help there a lot. Uh, depends on your specific application exactly what you need to do and what degrees of freedom you have. Uh, but it's an interesting place to play for sure. Okay. Okay. Thank but you. But in any case, in the spatial domain for imaging, what people is using is just a special, a special light modulator. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, no need Straight to. Straightforward solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So we have another question by Janelle. Yes, hi, um, my name is Ganael. Um, <laughs> hi guys. So yeah, uh, a lot of photos uh, know me um, and uh, it's very nice to see you again. So very nice talk and uh, it's, I mean, your results look amazing. And I was wondering um, what was the most challenging part uh, experimentally to make it uh, as good as that? Was it uh, to have the good parameters to create the good waveguard or was it the pearl shaper which gave the resolution of the pressure probably would be the limitation here. Hi, Gano. Nice to see you too. Um, yeah, I didn't talk about the pain of the experiment. So it, uh, I mean, as Christina said, uh, we developed these um, devices uh, over the years and uh, the years of work of different PhD students went to developing the pulse shaper and to developing the wave blood itself. Um, and finally doing the ATC experiment. So there's a hard work for developing the fabrication itself um, and uh, having a good quality there. There, is, there has been uh, some work for the shaping the pulses uh, to uh, have a perfect shaping. And at the end in this experiment uh, that we're doing also uh, because we're measuring very small time separations, uh, the stability of setup was very, very um, important that we could have stable um, basically uh, time delays that we want to measure. Um, so that was also another thing that we have to fight um, for the good weather condition and so on to find a good um, period of time that uh, everything's stable to perform the measurement. So yeah, thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, I think we are uh, approaching uh, our time limit soon. So uh, if any, more questions uh, people have. This is the, the time to ask, I assume. Uh, 
Okay, uh, so if, if no further questions, then I think it's, a, it's probably a good time to, to wrap up with the discussion. So I'd like to thank again Vahid for the excellent presentation and the entire team for really uh, awesome work and, and very interesting results. And uh, uh, Stoyan and Katusa, perhaps you'd like to say a few more words before we end? Uh, yes, uh, let me just share the screen with you again. Uh, so, yes, uh, I would like to extend our thanks on behalf of the organizers and physical review journals to all of the participants, Vahid and all of the authors uh, of, of the paper and your own special thank to you for moderating this session. Uh, before uh, we go, however, I'll have to, uh, I would like to warn you that we have a, a journal club website that is displayed uh, right here on this slide. And in this journal club uh, website, uh, you can see all of the previous uh, recordings of the talks that were there. And uh, for the future uh, journal clubs, you will see also the uh, uh, link to the register for the event once the event becomes available. So please come and visit our, uh, our journal club website and keep informed about these sessions uh, for the future. Thank you very much all for participation and hope to see you again in all of these uh, sessions. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.